It's kind of unfortunate that I haven't been able to record as much recently, but to put it simply, life is kind of lifing right now, you know? But to be honest with y'all, it's been a whole lot of good entering my world. So I've just been kind of sitting back and letting life do its thing. If you're going to bless me with a whole bunch of goodness, I am not going to stop you. I'm going to just sit back and watch it happen, you know? But just because I'm not talking to y'all does not mean that I'm not out there continuing to learn new things. When I learned a whole bunch of new things, the first people I want to share it with is all of y'all that chose to click on the video. So shout out to all of you. So in this video, we're going to keep up with the theme of looking at the Bible from a mystical standpoint, which is why I got my notes here. Y'all know I usually like to go off the top, but I want to make sure that I can present this information in a clear and succinct order. All right. So let's get into it. So the first question I want to propose to you all is why is it that we are supposed to be baptized by water and fire, right? You know, the water baptism makes sense. You know, we've been in church. We've all seen people get dunked in the water, whether it's in the church, whether it's at a river, a lake, some type of body of water. Nevertheless, that the, the, the water baptism already makes a little bit more sense to everybody. But I don't see too many people getting dunked in fire, right? So... The only reason I see you getting dunked in fire is either you're a political protester that thinks lighting yourself on fire is going to change the minds of millions, which I don't quite agree with, but do you, I guess. Or you pissed off the wrong mob boss and you didn't pay on time, so you got your punishment. That's the only reason I see people sitting in fire. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But one of the things that I've been preaching with this mystical understanding of the Bible is when the literal interpretation of the book doesn't quite make sense, you have to dig deeper. You have to get into that occult wisdom. A lot of people get turned off by the word occult when the word occult simply means hidden. The information that's hidden in plain sight. So let's go ahead and get into it. To help illustrate this point, let's first focus on two main characters, Jesus and John the Baptist. Okay. Jesus is a representation of the sun God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen is the sun God or the son of God god and specifically in egyptian spirituality you know he's the fire god right then we move over to john the baptist where john the baptist is a representation of the god of water what do i mean by that let's break it down you know sometimes to get the information that you need you have to escape christianity as a whole and you need to go to the things that predate it a lot of Christians do not want to admit that there were many other religions and spiritual beliefs and other different cultures before Christianity, right? That's a, for that simple fact right there is enough to make a whole bunch of Christians go run off into the woods. But nevertheless, in the Sumerian temple of Eridu, there's, the, the temple of Eridu is, is, uh, is dedicated to the water god Ea. I think that's how it's pronounced, E-A, right? Sports, it's in the game. But nevertheless, it's E-A, Ea, right? And as I was writing these notes down this morning to, to make this video, I learned that Ea is also Inky. And for those of you who know about Inky and Enlil, you could probably draw some correlations. But I don't know anything about Inky and Enlil like that. I've just been hearing them a lot. So I'm not going to speak on them too much on this video, right? But nevertheless, so Ea is the water god. Ea, Ea in Greek is spelled out I-O-N-N-E-S-S, -S, Ionis, right? But... The thing that a lot of people don't don't really put together is that the letter I in Greek is is pronounced like a J. Right. So in Latin, it's pr pronounced jo Johannes or Johannes, J-O-H-A-N-N-E-S. Right. And then in English, it's John, John, the water god. OK. And if that doesn't if that doesn't sound right to you, it just so happens that that John the Baptist was the one that baptized water it baptized Jesus. You see what I'm saying? You see the theme, the water theme, the water and John, John the Baptist, John the water God. He's representative of something that existed before Christianity. OK, so one of the things that I learned was John the Baptist was a prophet. Right. He was like in, in Google searches. He's like he's like a Jewish preacher, you know, but specifically he's the prophet of the Essenes and the Nazarenes. Right. So one of the things that I learned with this, though, was like a lot of people, when they look at baptism, they look at it as some external practice that helps you get to God. Now, once again, to each their own. But I personally don't believe that any external thing gets you to God in many different in many different instances in the Bible, which I'm actually going to record right after this. All that is an internal thing. 
Now, if you need an external tool, if you need a tool, if you need a toy that helps you learn a lesson, that helps you get within and do what you gotta do, then so be it. You know, I'm not here to disrespect anybody's anybody's practice, but I just wanna add another level of truth or another level of wisdom and some knowledge that you can help apply to your own life, you know? But baptism in these days was a rite of sacred doctrine. It wasn't necessarily like the way to God, like you get baptized in the water and now you're one with God. No, that's just the right that you can now learn all these sacred doctrines that will inevitably teach you the right way to do things. That's just how I perceive it. You can have your own opinions. OK, now we got that out of the way with those two beings. We, we got fire and water. But for those of you that know the basic elements, we have earth, water, air, fire. Right. So in the Greek translation, you'll quickly find out that all these different religions, all these different spiritual beliefs are all talking about the same thing. What do I mean by that? In Greek, like I just said, we have earth, water, air, fire, and the new mind. Let me do it like this. Earth, water, air, fire, and the new mind. Be ye restored by the renewing of your mind, as it's spoken, right? In Indian culture, and then forgive me if I, pronou if I mispronounce these things, but we got stua, stuha, you know, S-T-U-H-A, Kama, K A M A, Manas, M A N A S, Budi, <laughs> B U D D H I, and Atma, A T M A. In, in Christian understanding, we have sensation, the physical sensation. Then we have the lower sensation, mental, Holy Ghost, Son of God. That's why we have Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, right? But then we get into why I say it's the mother, father, and child. Because in Egyptian spirituality, we have the Nephthys, N-E-P-H-T-Y-S, which is like your, a representation of the carnal, the lowest version of yourself. We have Set, S-E-T, Thoth, T-H-O-T-H, uh, -T Isis, and Osiris, right? Osiris, and you'll see the similarities in the stories because Osiris sacrificed himself for the good of humankind. And when he died, I might be messing up a few of the little details here because that's not what I plan on talking about, but my brain is there. But then, like, you know, Osiris gave his life so for the for the good of humankind. And then Isis, like, laid atop of him and through Immaculate Conception, I believe it said Heru, but it may be, maybe Thoth. But nevertheless, Thoth Heru was born, okay? Immaculate Conception, someone sacrificed himself for the greater the greater mankind. You see how this story, like, from a... Uh, from e Egypt translates into all these other things. You see, you'll see how Buddhism is in the Bible. You'll see how uh, 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 Hinduism is in the Bible. It's all there. Stop living in this one little bubble when you realize that they all are telling the same exact story. I got my little breakdown right here. I'm not sure if it's too legible and my handwriting is trash, but pause the video and if it's not backwards, there you go. Okay? So, what we need to understand is keeping it on the elemental conversation. Earth to water is the baptism air air is like the thought above the mind this is what is referred to as the rapture and then and then after you you rise above the level of thought when you meet jesus in the air a lot of people think that's a literal thing that never made sense to me even as a child but nevertheless then you will be baptized by father and you meet and you you reach the higher level of existence the new mind the atma the son of god osiris the the christ consciousness okay jesus was sent here as a messenger to bring us back to God, to that Christ consciousness. As, as I've echoed many times from Eddie Griffin, a lot of people are getting hung up on the messenger. Did you get the message? And I feel that a lot of people didn't get the message because they're hung up on just Jesus, 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 when he was telling us how to ascend and how to be one with God, okay? So what you need to remember is that water is, re like the, wa the water stage is reached through meditation where God's truth is, is able to touch you, right? Air is when you rise above thought and you meet Christ in the air, like I just said. That's why Jesus said to take no thought. Take no thought about what you eat. Take no thought about your clothes. Take no thought about the stresses that daily life is giving you. Take no thought about it. Eliminate the five senses and be in communion with God. To be in communion does not mean to, to eat the bread and drink the blood of Christ. It's just saying that out loud. Does that really make sense? But nevertheless, you're entitled to your own opinion. And then the fire purges all things that hurt you in your lower being. Okay? 
So when you ascend through all the stuff from the earth to the water to the air to the fire, be ye restored by the renewing of your mind. That's when you see, you know, God, essentially, right? So let's just put this into layman's terms, right? You are exploring a lake or something. You're swimming in a pond. And you, when you're going down there, you touch the bottom of it and you feel something in there, right? You reach down in the bottom. Is What do you pull out? It's like, let's just say a something more harder than this but let's just say for example you found this you found this notebook right <laughs> hypothetically you found this notebook at the bottom of the river you know you find a big rock you find a diamond in the rough right you find something down there what do you do you pull it out of the lake out of the pond out of the water out of the dirt out of the mud out of the muck out of the congestion of the mine you find something so when you find this thing in the mud, what do you do? Well, it would make sense to wash it off so you can see what it is, right? So rising from the earth level of conscience, the carnal, the thing that can only be proven by the physical senses, which is why so many people will call me a blasphemer and I'm here to dissuade you and take you to the realm of the devil and all this type of stuff because they haven't seen it before. They never heard that before. So because it, it hasn't been uh, uh, made present to them in the physical world, the carnal self, the physical, the earth, it doesn't make sense to them. But you need the truth of God to enter your life. So you find that thing in the water and you wash it off, right? So then after you're done washing it off, what do you do? You dry it off in the air, right? So when the truth of God hits you, you can now rise above the level of that earthly thought. And you are no longer dictated by the, the five senses, the, the feeling, touching, hearing, smelling, tasting. You're no longer dictated by those and you are operating from a higher state. You are communing with Jesus in the higher perspectives, right? And then, you know, uh, let's see, then fire, right? And then we're like, with the fire... I don't really have a good one for that, but let's just say you let it sit out and dry. <laughs> All right, it's the final product. Let's just use the diamond in the rough example. You find a diamond in the mud, you wash it off. You know, you wash it off with water, you dry it out. And then once it's dried out, it's been had that air touch it, then it now shines, shine bright like a diamond. Like, you know what I'm saying? So that's what's going on here. But the, all of this is going on with your mind, with your soul, with your spirit. That's why the caduceus has a snake going up the uh, going up the staff, going up the pole. That pole, that staff is your spine. You know, it's, it's the physical representation of ascension. OK, that's what the whole book is telling you. Yes, the snake starts off as an evil thing because it's, your, it's, it's dictated by the lower realms. But once it rises up, that's why at the top of the caduceus, it has the wings because you're now floating up there and, and you, 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 your brain is out there on a whole nother level. You know what I'm saying? So nevertheless, I hope this meant something to you. I hope you all got something from this. If you have any more to contribute to this, feel free to let me know. Till the next one. Peace.